Thanks, Ivan. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, now I'm launching this this live stream. Then I'll I'll mute myself for a second because maybe then it's uh, Joyce. You're gonna start. You're gonna. All right. So yeah. now we are. But now I'm hearing someone. Oh, sorry, it's YouTube. I'm sorry. This is YouTube. Okay. Should we still uh, switch on this translation button, uh, Ivan? Uh, our... I think that while I uh, when I begin and uh, tell to tell some words, so I will be in this uh, on the screen. Then I will turn my video off and you start like that. I think like we did we, we did that last time. Yeah, that's perfect. And because you mm -hmm. explained to us with that little yeah the notes, translation the mm -hmm. translation button, we need to to choose that. And also uh, yes yes yes. Let's let let's make it. Let's switch to I start the translation. Okay. And and you can now, now choose English. You could now choose English. Yes. Okay, I did. All right, that's nice. Let's check if everything is working. Uh, Valia, Valia, Daria, uh, do you hear us? Just write me on the Telegram chat or here. Yeah, you hear. All right, you hear. Ah, uh, we don't hear them now. Uh, no, no. Nice. Yes, they hear. Here. They're hearing us. It's all right. Nice. Great. Okay. Philippe wants to say something, but I think Philippe is on mute. Maybe you can tell us on WhatsApp, Philippe. Or yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the problem uh, don't, don't put yourself on 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 mute because you can't um, because we can't switch it on ourselves or off. So I think we always need Ivan then to do that. So yes, I will be I, here always, but I just turn my video on or off, so like that. Yeah, yeah. But I think for us, for the three speakers, don't put yourself on on uh, on mute because you can't switch it on again yourself. So okay, so. okay. No, that's good. Yeah, no, yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Okay. I can actually, uh, actually, I can make no, but, you an an uh, a host, or uh, because like we have, uh, we can make ten people a host. No, the, no, don't worry. Uh, just uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep quiet and all right, and all, yeah, right no all right. And maybe just one more point from our side, uh, Ivan, or because you're allowing people in the session, right? Uh, sorry, I haven't heard you well. No. Oh, sorry, Ivan. We have one person, uh, Mark, from our team also joining. So he will not be All a right. speaker, All uh, right. but he's All a right. new member of the team. So he wanted to, to experience mm -hmm. this as well. All right, great, great. Yeah. So I think that I'll check now YouTube. Is it all right? Yes, it's all right. And I think that we could start to to accept people who are waiting in the room. All right. All right, so we have people joining. Okay, all right. Uh, Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We uh, we were asked to uh, to ask you to turn your video on if it's possible, so we could see each other here in uh, Zoom. Uh, your mics for now should remain uh, muted, but actually you can't do it yourself because like, I prohibited that. Uh, but if uh, we will have a discussion in the end of uh, our webinar, uh, I think that we could uh, turn the mic on if, if, if it would be ne ne uh, necessary. All right, so we have now 20, 28 people here. I think that we will wait one more minute because uh, because we started 12 o'clock. All right. All right, someone signed up for, for the webinar just right now. <laughs> so there's some late bird that is joining us. All right.
maybe just for now we should we should uh, we should hide the presentation because uh like that yes it's like that all right so we could start yeah mm -hmm. we will explain now for people who just came how to how to turn on the trans translation tool and Daria and uh, will uh, will will translate it to uh, to Russian. So, uh, in order to uh, turn on your translation, you need to uh, to find a globe, and there will be uh, a word translate. <laughs> you should press the button and choose Russian. It's easy. And uh, also, also when you will do that, we will try to make a test translation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand now that maybe you're not hearing the translators for now because you didn't turn the. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will speak now Russian. Добрый uh, день, господа, дамы. Я объясню вам, как включить перевод. Значит, у вас есть меню. Если вы сидите с компьютера, у вас есть меню снизу, там где звук, видео, все остальное, там есть глобус, и на этом глобусе написано перевод. Нажмите на эту кнопку и выберите русский язык. Больше вам ничего делать не надо, и у вас появится перевод. Если вы сидите с телефона, то у вас в меню снизу есть три точки. Нажмите на эти три точки, нажмите перевод, выберите русский язык. Вот. Также у вас есть такой функционал справа возле списка, не списка, вернее, возле участника. Вы можете нажать на галочку с вы можете нажать на галочку с зеленым цветом, либо на крестик. И тогда обозначите, услышали вы нас а, или нет. Все, да, работает. Отлично, хорошо. Вот у меня тоже работает. Замечательно. All right. Uh, now I will speak English. If uh, someone have some technical issues, please uh, contact us on uh, that uh, uh, on that uh, uh, Telegram chat we have for the issues. You can just write us, or you can write in chat. Если у вас будут какие-то проблемы то у нас сегодня работает технический оператор Женя, она ответит на ваши вопросы в чате. Чат вы найдете справа, справа внизу. Можете написать свой вопрос туда. Хорошо, все, мы все это поняли. All right, so we should probably start because we have 34 persons on, uh, on, uh, on Zoom and some people are joining on, on YouTube. I think we should start. Uh, all right. Hello, guys, and welcome uh, to uh, Sklat Online Educational Platform. My name is Zinvan, and I'm your host for this, uh, I don't know, morning, or maybe if you are in Kazakhstan, it's late night. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to remind you that uh, it's COVID today, and you should stay home and stay safe. Uh, also, I would like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you are seeing the stream on YouTube, you should just press the subscribe button and follow us on Facebook. Uh, after the presentation, we will give you a links and also we will give links to our speakers uh, LinkedIn or a website uh, where you can find some more information about the company they represent today. So now uh, I would like to introduce some people that are working on technical stuff today. It's uh, Evgenia, she's making a uh, She's a technical moderator. If you have some questions, uh, you can just ask them in the chat. <clears throat> uh, you can see the chat on the uh, right down side of uh, Zoom if you are uh, if you are if you are um, watching the stream from uh, PC or Mac, or if you are watching it from your mobile phone, you can see that you can turn on the chat and you will see the chat. It's like three three dots uh, on the down side of the of your of your screen uh, of your phone. Uh, now we have two uh, people who are, uh, will help us with translation today. It's Daria and uh, Valentina. Uh, uh, the first part will be translated by Daria and the second part will be translated by Valentina. Uh, uh, if you will have some issues with translation, you uh, must not hesitate to write it on chat. Just write it and uh, we will solve this problem. So. Now I'll give uh, the world to our first speaker. It will be Joyce Richards. Hello, Joyce. Hello. Hi, Ivan. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you as well. Hi. I hope everybody can hear me well. 
And uh, thank you for tuning in uh, today. It's really exciting uh, also for all of us to be connected in these crazy COVID times uh, across ourselves amongst the world. So it's really beautiful uh, that we can still have this interaction. Um, we're happy to be here uh, from the Kennedy Fitch team with all of you. Um, and Maria is gonna share her screen with us. So while we speak, uh, we also have some slides for, uh, for reference. Um, let me just pause for a moment. Yes, thank you very much. And we'll do a first, uh, a short introduction on uh, who we are from Kennedy Fitch and also who my colleagues uh, are here with us uh, tuning in from different locations. Uh, and then we'll be happy to take you through a story on the future of work. So what's happening in our world? What are some of the big trends uh, we're seeing and how does that influence uh, the way we work together, but also how does it influence our HR profession? And then uh, we'd love to take you on a journey uh, in one of those fields that have become very uh, actual now for some of us, but that may sound as a bit of future still for some others uh, of us. We see that very varied across different companies, uh, which is the journey of employee experience. So we have a few things in store for you uh, that we'd love to share with you. And then we'd also love to keep uh, ample of time for uh, interaction. So maybe you have some questions that are coming up while we speak. Uh, and also we're aiming to address the questions that you sent to us before uh, hand actually. Um, and if we can't cover all of it in the coming uh, two hours, uh, then we will make sure that we share with you uh, some of our answers afterwards. Now with that, if we could go to the next slide, uh, Maria. Uh, because who are we from, from Kennedy Fitch? Uh, we're actually uh, a team of people that uh, today are working in uh, consulting, uh, united under the umbrella of, of Kennedy Fitch, and we're proud to be uh, part of the Kennedy Fitch family, as we always say, uh, but our backgrounds are not um, career or sorry, career consultants or consulting backgrounds. We actually have worked in the fields, uh, in the business fields, uh, often in HR or in HR specialist areas uh, for about 20 years. Now, if we indeed go to the next slide, thank you, Maria, you'll see our different pictures. Um, I'm the one on the first picture um, and I have a 20 year background uh, in HR business partnering roles and HR specialist roles in multinationals. Um, and been with uh, Kennedy Fitch now for, uh, for about three years. So I'm happy to give the floor to Philippe who will also introduce himself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, so Daria, uh, I'll, I'll slow down a little bit. Uh, Thank you. So that you uh, are able to do uh, the translation. So my name is Philippe Bock. Um, I live and work in, in Belgium. Um, so, and as Joyce said, I was also before that um, living and working in the corporate world um, in many different uh, international companies such as DHL, and in my last role, I was the global head of talent management of a global food retailer. And I joined uh, Kennedy Fitch in 2016. Can I give oh. the floor to Maria? Yes, thank Maria. you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Philippe. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is uh, Maria Nego. I am originally from Romania, but I live and I work in the Netherlands. I have a background in consulting for human resources. I've also worked for Philips Healthcare in Italian management. And I joined Kennedy Fitch last year um, in my work for Kennedy Fitch. I'm sorry, Maria, maybe I ask you to speak up a bit because uh, yeah. the sound is now is not so well. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry for interrupting yeah. you. No, no worries, no worries. Um, so I was saying that uh, I joined Kennedy Fitch um, uh, last year and I'm focused on employee experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for notifying me. And we also um, should have had a colleague of ours, Melika, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. But um, yeah, we're grateful to be here with you. Joyce, should I move on? Yes, thank you very much. So we're happy to be here with the Kennedy Fitch team uh, for you today. 
Now, what do we do in our daily consulting lives uh, at Kennedy Fitch? We actually uh, bring to table three main activities. Uh, one is around executive search. Uh, we do quite some searches within HR, but also in other fields, uh, like in uh, digital uh, roles and digital companies. Then we do um, quite a bit of work on talent and transformation consulting, which we will give some more information on uh, also in a minute. And last but not least, we love to do what we call community building and knowledge sharing. Uh, so we love to bring people together, be it in conferences or be it in smaller scale events or be it in webinars like this, uh, where we can jointly connect and share uh, perspective, experience, knowledge, um, and to actually uh, strengthen ourselves as an HR community as a total. Let me just do a quick check if this is the right place for talking, uh, Ivan. Uh, yes, uh, I think that we should uh, we should start our presentation. Maybe if you have uh, some questions already, you can ask them. Uh, but for now, I think that we should move on, maybe. With that. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. So let's uh, share a little bit of what we do on um, talent and transformation consulting, uh, because most of the uh, activities or projects we work on with clients are around uh, helping their organization go through change and build the required talent and leadership development along with this. Um, and what we try to do is not only uh, do that from a rational perspective, so help shape future and give guidance uh, or clarity on what that looks, uh, but also take people along uh, in, through their hearts. So feel like they want to be part of uh, this journey. Uh, so we work a lot with changes in mindsets uh, and in behaviors, and we do that at different uh, levels. So if we could go to the next slide. You see that we have interventions, as we call them, on an organization level, on a team level, and also on a personal or individual level. And examples of what we do at an organization level are, um, for instance, helping organizations to define their people strategy for the future or helping them to go through uh, strategic workforce planning or build their employee experience approach that Maria will deep dive in a little bit later today. What we mostly do at team level or some examples of those um, are uh, working with teams. It could be leadership teams, HR teams, or other functional teams um, that in a united way, for instance, need to go through change or they want to optimize the way they work uh, together or sometimes they may want to address some tension or conflicts that are there in the team. And we help those teams through what we call team performance coaching. And last but not least, at an individual level, some examples are executive coaching. Uh, or being a sparring partner of uh, HR leaders or leaders in a company uh, to help them define their way forward. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So I think we already briefly mentioned uh, the way we, we really aim to work because we've seen that this sorts most of the impact in practice is that we want to address both the head and the heart of the matters. So in bringing transformation, it will only be sustainable if there's clarity. So the head is clear on why do we do things and what does it look like? And if we build skills, uh, but also if our heart is fully into this. So if we believe in the story, if we are daring to shift our beliefs or our mindset, so it's always a combination in addressing the head and the heart uh, that makes transformation stick, which is what we focus on. 
And if we go to the next slide, we already indicated uh, we're not so called career consultants. So we've really had backgrounds and experienced all the pains and all the joys of doing things that we now consult on in ourselves. Uh, and we aim to customize. Uh, so we co-create a lot with the clients um, and hope to bring to them what they need instead of what we may be advocating. So every project in that sense is, is leading to unique solutions. And then I come to the end, most, or almost to the end of our introduction. Um, yeah, we really do this because we we believe that this is the way that actually we sort most of the impact, but also, um, yeah, actually it's most uh, fun and engaging in working uh, together, uh, also with all the people in the organization. Um, and this is why we take it forward. So I hope that serves as a good introduction uh, to who you see around this virtual table um, and what Kennedy Fitch stands for, what we aim for. Um, let me just pause if that, to see if this works well in this space. And then I'm happy to give the floor to Philippe who's gonna take us on a journey to the future. Thank you, Joyce. And everything is, work, uh, is working just fine. Uh, if you have some issues, you could write it on chat. If you have some technical issues uh, with translation or with uh, the uh, with the streaming, but as I see and I am aware of, uh, everything is going just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Then from the Netherlands, let me give the floor to Belgium. It uh, sounds a little bit like the Euro Song cost, uh, Contest. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, I'll give 10 points to, to Belarusia. Um, so, um, so I'll take you now a little bit uh, into, the, into the future. Um, so uh, Maria, if you can uh, click one on. Um, if we look at uh, the workforce of the future, uh, we see in fact two big elements that are colliding at this moment in time. Uh, on the one hand side, you see um, a quite some demographic changes happening. And on the other side, we see quite some technological breakthroughs or uh, digital elements that uh, start to, to play out. And uh, what, we, what we need to take into consideration is what on the one hand side, what is, what is um, what is your workforce um, happening or what, what is there the, um, the outlook? And that can be different, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, that can be different depending on geographic locations. Um, but also on the other side, um, uh, I think the technology part will influence quite a lot how we collaborate and how we become more productive. Um, so this inner space or this middle space of this uh, diagram also says that we, we will work in a different way or um, our workforce will behave in a different way into the future. If you can jump to the next slide, Maria. Um, this is um, on the demographical side and this is just a listing of things that we see happening. Um, and I'll, I'll go into one more specific, but we see that um, the, uh, um, yeah, the workforce definitely on the north is getting older. Um, and we should also ask ourselves, um, when is the right age to stop? Because we think that um, people will become 100 years older. Um, um, of course, in the COVID time, it, it is maybe a little bit more questionable but um, people uh, tend to live longer. Um, on the other side, we also see that you have a mix of four generations going to work. So you might have uh, millennials working next to baby boomers and they have a different, um, I would say, um, a view on work. Um, 
if you look really at um, at where the the biggest potential from a youth perspective sits today, uh, you have, for instance, Africa, and um, uh, some some companies um, have uh, have really looked into the African workforce, um, like um, and then I've forgotten the name, and I need uh, maybe the help of my colleagues there. Um, there was a, a subsidiary of Facebook. Uh, who went and, and recruited uh, very talented uh, programmers in Africa, brought them for three months uh, to uh, the US to learn them do coding and then brought them back to Africa. So there is a huge potential uh, of workforce in Africa, uh, but um, also to be seen how that plays out. Um, then on, on another element that plays is the whole mobility. Um, uh, there is a, we have seen that with uh, the refugees coming from Africa and Syria, uh, that is also impacting and changing our workforce quite, um, quite heavily. And then last but not least, you have some, um, some areas like uh, Japan, uh, who have really aging workforce, um, and there they have to close schools. So you see it is a, very unbalanced um, way. Uh, if we look at, for instance, India and China, uh, they will produce a large part of um, the engineers and the, some of the graduates. So how does this influence our workforce of the future? So it's something you should think about. And then uh, the last uh, population, uh, it is the, the millennials. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you will see um, a graph um, with how the distribution, um, and this is um, uh, this is a I would say a, a view of the U.S. labor market. Unfortunately, I don't have this one of uh, of uh, ours, but uh, it is quite similar where you see that uh, the millennials have become the majority of the workforce by now. Um, so, as I said, there is a mix of four generations, but the millennials become the largest uh, population. Um, and let me go to the next slide, because I think it could be interesting uh, to, to take some of the characteristics of millennials in mind. Um, so, first of all, they have uh, high expectations, um, so they they want to um, be promoted faster, but also have some of merit expectations, and that comes um, to a, a further point I will make later on. Um, they are also not um, they're often quite likely to leave for um, some reason, uh, and that reason is often driven by uh, opportunities. Um, so they, they really want to develop uh, career opportunities faster than other generations uh, because they had or they have grown up with choice. Um, uh, choice that was probably a little bit more limited in the past, but they definitely had choice. Um, what was also Im important for them is they want to have impact. Um, so therefore, also we see more and more organizations uh, that are this purpose-led driven organizations because um, if an organization has a clear purpose, uh, millennials have easier to see what their impact will be on the bigger part. So I think it's also a characteristic we see in organizations changing. And then last but not least, they are um, impatient uh, because many of the millennials have grown up in divorced couples. Um, and if they then would ask, uh, can I have the new iPhone, daddy? Uh, and daddy says, no, maybe then they go and see mom and maybe they might get it from mom. Um, so they have, they have grown up in an instant gratification modus. And that has created um, uh, some characteristics of this impatience. So I think some of the elements uh, that you have to take along uh, in your workforce if you design solutions for them.
let's go to the next slide. Then we'll uh, look a little bit into the technology piece. Um, so um, in technology, or we see a lot of companies um, that they they simply have to uh, change or to this or they will disappear. And you have multiple examples like Kodak and other companies that have uh, not digitalized or not uh, adapted themselves to the uh, to the needs of the the digital world, and they have unfortunately uh, gone bankrupt. Um, also, another element we see that uh, data or big data um, become uh, exponentially important, uh, and uh, and the massive uh, or the amount uh, of data that have been produced is, is, is really exponential. Uh, then we also see much more artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, um, machine learning. So this is also something that's definitely influencing our workforce. Um, then the whole part of gaming and, and, and the, the virtual um, um, industry, but with, there is a specific the, the, the point around competencies um, uh, that the, the when before you, you came out of business school, you could last, I would say, 30 years um, with your knowledge. Uh, now this has dropped to five years. And recently I read an article that whenever an engineer in Germany comes out, his or her part of the knowledge is obsolete. Uh, within six months to a year time. So, uh, so the, the speed of which we um, gain information is only increasing uh, massively. Uh, then mobile is everywhere. So we say that uh, yeah, your mobile phone will become your uh, computer. And whenever you design HR solutions, it should be mobile proof. Um, so I think that uh, that uh, should be should be something to keep in mind. And then we have other technologies like uh, blockchain, um, and blockchain will create higher transparency. Um, so and this blockchain uh, could be also applied to domains that are um, even non-financial. Uh, for instance, there is an example now in food retail with sustainable fishery where they use blockchain uh, methodology to trace uh, where the fish is coming from. Um, so just to give you there some, um, some ideas to, to think about uh, how is technology going to influence your workforce. Let's go, let's go on. Um, yeah, so th this is what, what we see. So it's, um, and it's unfortunately also a little bit the same uh, scenario what we have been seeing with the whole COVID-19 uh, experience that, that we have really um, are in front of an exponential world uh, because the, the increase, it is not a linear, um, uh, I would say a linear growth but you will see a shortage of uh, workforce, for instance, or you will see the exponential, exponential growth of technology, and this will create a disruption. Um, and I can tell you as a, as a recruiter, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing quite some search work, um, before the COVID-19 uh, crisis, it became really, uh, exponentially more difficult to find uh, talented people because there is a shortage uh, due to the workforce. The age pyramid in, in the Western world is upside down and a lot of people are going on pension for the moment and there is not enough uh, talent anymore to replace uh, the ones who are leaving. So there, there is this disruption in the workforce. We see a lot of jobs uh, that that remain un, unfilled uh, at this point in time. So there is definitely disruption taking place in the workforce. Uh, let's move on, uh, Maria. Thank you. Um, another another element I think we need to take into consideration is also that um, 
the organizations from a structural point of view are changing. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see the classic model of an organization where most of the people are on the payroll uh, and a smaller portion that is um, was, was built up by um, people who were independent consultants. Um, mainly, you saw this in the IT environment. Um, today, we see that this uh, contingent workforce is growing uh, so that this, uh, the core of the organizations becomes smaller on payroll and that the contingent workforce becomes uh, larger. And if we look into the future, you will have a third uh, circle around that is also your machine um, capability. So what, what, is your, um, what, what is your quality of your chatbots? What is the quality of your artificial intelligence? Uh, so you will have uh, a third layer that um, becomes larger. Uh, and we think that we're going to transition more and more into these um, in this into this kind of structure and so the cost and the distance to a workforce will will change for sure okay let's move on so this is an example of uh, as uh, so this is an example of the netherlands and so if you look at the workforce uh, around uh, Sixty percent these days is still on payroll, and then uh, roughly the other forty percent is uh, is contingent or is an are some independent uh, workforce. Now, um, an important element to put next to that is also that um, uh, it each uh, the the metal has always a a, a flip side. Um, so there is more flexibility, but also um, some people are also complaining because they're pushed more into this independent work for statutory. So for instance, like um, people who are driving pizzas by bikes or, or they are pushed into an independent uh, status because it is cheaper uh, for, the, um, for the company to hire those. Um, so it, it is also a little bit tricky to a degree. So um, it is it has flexibility, but there is also a dangerous flip side that people might be pushed into what we call um, fake independence because then they might be working only for one boss uh, and, and and this this independent then person is squeezed really. So it, it is a little bit of a risk also. So let's be let's be honest. And um, if I compare Belgium to the Netherlands, um, the Netherlands is always a little bit more ahead of the curve. So we are lagging uh, a few years. So for us, this mix is not as large. Uh, but if you look into Netherlands, they are always a little bit ahead uh, in um, HR uh, practices. So uh, always interesting to follow uh, in the, I would say, in the Benelux. Definitely uh, the Netherlands are ahead. Let's move on. So an, another, another element or something that you have to uh, look into is, um, as I just said, the externalization of the workforce we, we just witnessed on the previous slide. But you will also get an unbundling of jobs. So where before a job was done by uh, one, one single person, you can now unravel it uh, and, and Due to the technology, or to um, um, yeah, yeah, mainly to technology, you can unbundle. Uh, if you would uh, look at uh, how a car is built these days, uh, before you had one manufacturer who did everything. Today, if you look at a car manufacturing, uh, that is a I would say nearly like a puzzle box that comes from all different companies. Um, so uh, th th this is how a job is done. Um, also the virtualization of work um, is also, you, you can have, and, and we have it for instance with Upwork, uh, we, we sometimes uh, 
uh, ask people, and I don't know if you're familiar with the platform Upwork, but it's, it's in fact a platform where you can find uh, resources all over the world. Uh, and you can see customers' reviews, you see the hourly rate. It is like the Airbnb of the workforce. Uh, um, and and can be can be interesting and um, yeah so Maria just uh, shared the the link so we'll send it later to you also that you can look into it uh, but it's a very interesting business model um, towards the, the virtualization and then the last part is the packetization of me uh, you can slice uh, me for instance um, you could slice my head off or my arm because you only need my arm uh, for a certain piece of work uh, before you had to hire me, my entireness. Um, today, that's not needed anymore because you can hire an independent worker to come and do a specific piece of work and then let me and, do, and let me go again. Um, so you get more of this packetization of uh, workforce and that will only increase because also, you have more and more in-depth knowledge needs, uh, and then you need a, you need a piece of Maria, and then you need Denise, a piece of uh, Ivan, uh, and how that then you bundle that and you bring that to uh, one final product. Let's move on. Um, so this is then a little bit more towards the work models, um, and this is also then I would say a um, a, uh, a, a further development. Um, and, and here we have to be a little bit mindful that uh, although we say this is uh, how things were, and I think uh, still in a lot of companies, this is how it still is, where you see a clear um, linear, uh, uh, linear model, so where you have a boss and then departments below. In the future, we, we or how things uh, are now, let's say, um, is, is more a networked organization where people work in, in teams, etc. And in the future, uh, it will be a network of networks um, and where you have then a free flow of resources and information. For the time, let's move on. Um, and then my final slide is also where this is how typical HR is. Um, uh, how, how a typical HR structure, are we can, yeah, this one. This is how typical an HR structure then would be designed and we have done structures and processes and systems for this kind of uh, a constituency. But you should ask yourself the next, uh, if you go to the next slide, but you should ask yourself um, if you have to design new practices uh, how will that then function in the uh, in the structure of how things will be? Um, so if you have to design HR um, practices and people pra uh, practices, how will they look like in a networked uh, organization rather than in this more classic um, uh, org chart structured one? So think about because I think we are moving towards these organizations. And with this, I'll pause. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Philippe. I'll take it uh, from here. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, how we see HR evolving actually uh, on the verge of what Philippe has been sharing with us uh, in terms of the big trends and the impact on the future of work. But let me do one check before we go there, uh, which is whether we need a small energizer. We usually do energizers when we sit for some time uh, and we've been sitting for 40 minutes. So All shall right. we? That's a nice idea. <laughs> yes. And usually when we do energizers, we do we try and make it a bit fun. Now I I saw that we have not everybody has the ability maybe also to put their um, or the possibility I mean to put their video on. But if you can, it would be great if you can join us for two minutes with video. Should I also stop sharing, Joyce, so we can see uh, everyone yes, on the screen? Yeah. 
Yes, thank you, Maria. So I see a few videos. Is there a possibility to for more people to put their videos on? Ah, great. I see some nice to see everyone. Faces coming up. Hi, great to see faces on that side. Thank you. Now I'm assuming that everybody who had the opportunity or has the opportunity to switch their video on uh, has done so. Uh, if it's not possible due to connection, of course, we fully respect that. Now I'm going to give you a little assignment uh, and it's going to be, I'm going to mention a color. And when I mention the color, I'd like you to look around at the place you're sitting and find something of that color as quickly as you can. All right. Is that okay? You don't have to destroy your office for that. So. <laughs> or your home. <laughs> yeah? Are you ready to hear what color it would be and to bring something in as soon as you can? Yes, let's go. Yes? Okay, let's make it green. <laughs> Green pen. Oh, yes. beautiful. Green plant. Nice. <laughs> green pen. No green. Got green, a pencil. Bit green, here. green box there. Yeah. Green, oh, yes. cool. Is it a green, beautiful cup or a small thing to put something on? Beautiful. Nice. Yes. Uh, I see some green planes on the background of uh, <laughs> the book. Uh, of <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was a nice. plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Very <laughs> nice. I'll give you one more color and then we'll continue with the serious stuff. Is that okay? All right. Okay, the next color is uh, blue. Blue. Uh, I, know. I got a blue in my background. So, got my ah, snake. Ah, blue, oh, yeah. Got my snake here. Wow. <laughs> oh, oh, like somebody's playing tennis. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> post its of course. Yeah, post its We have Credit the same idea. Yes. <laughs> nice. Thank you. A toy? Nice. Nice. I'm switching between screens so I can see all of your videos. Yeah, thank you. So let's go back to the serious stuff. These are right. the small things that keep us energized for the next uh, session. Thanks, guys, for playing along. <laughs> We'll go back to the slides. And right. as we said, we want to build on Philippe's story and share with you uh, how do we see HR evolving based on all of these developments that we've just shared. If we can go to the next slide. That was the energizer. energizer. Yeah. Perfect. So first of all, something, something is changing in our paradigms in our the way we look at things and when we say it is changing it may be uh, very much already there for some companies uh, it may also be really still out there in the future for some other companies so this is not to say that all of us are moving uh, or have moved in this direction but especially for instance if we look at uh, um, digital startups they very much live, uh, at least the clients we see, at the right-hand side uh, of these um, convictions or philosophies. Uh, whereas we also still see a lot of companies uh, also that we work with more on the left side. But generally, we see this evolvement happening. Now, one of the big changes is the conviction from sort of we own or we manage our human resources, as we say, the people in our companies, very much to, you know, we need to, uh, to sort of bring them in, lure them in, uh, convince them to join us, motivate and attract. So a very different, more almost consumer or customer oriented perspective. Uh, which for instance, we see also reflected in, um, in our performance management approaches. So from a very uh, well forced ranking or ranking decided by leaders uh, through, for instance, calibration, much more a bottom-up 
perspective. So how do people feel about their work? What do they want and aim to develop? Uh, and what is their input to the company? Um, Philippe already shared with us the third point. So really moving from the perspective of talents are full-time uh, entities on our payroll, uh, much more in sort of integral perspective of our talent includes everybody who works for us in one way or the other, in one shape or the other. Um, which also brings an interesting uh, point for data and analytics, uh, where we come from a world where the company, if at all they would gather uh, personnel data uh, or people data, also it would be owned by the company. So it's in files or systems at the company side. Whereas we see a clear move to, especially with people uh, moving around from company to company or from job to job, um, that actually they are owning uh, and gathering their own data. And we may even see a moment uh, in the future where the data will have a value. So I would come into a certain company uh, for a certain time or for a certain job, and I would bring my so-called personnel data, um, but dear company, you may need to pay me for it because you're interested in having these data points available on me and my colleagues. So it's quite a, a change in, in paradigm or perspective. Now, if we can go to the next slide, um, there's a few examples uh, we wanted to share. And then we will also look at what typical HR structures or organization setups do we see. Now, if you look at um, some examples, one big thing that we see happening, and maybe you, you recognize it from your side, is uh, what we call candidate-driven recruitment. So I've worked in multinationals where we just need to open the door and then talent would be very happy to work with us. Um, maybe it's a bit exaggerated, but more or less they would walk in and be happy uh, to have the job. Whereas now we see a complete change uh, that it's such a competitive space out there uh, that we need to put the candidate experience central because otherwise they will just choose to go somewhere else. So this whole candidate experience and seeing the candidate or the employee for that matter, uh, more as a customer uh, is a complete uh, perspective change versus what we saw some years ago. Um, there's also an interesting one that says uh, the Netflix of learning. So from a situation where we have maybe one catalog with learning options, you can choose course A, B or C. Uh, much more an, a menu of options where maybe one colleague chooses one thing and the other colleague chooses something completely different. And also to fill that catalog or that Netflix of learning, uh, there's a lot of crowd learning or sometimes crowdsourcing. Maybe you know something that would be of value for me to learn. So maybe you're part of sharing that knowledge with me when we're two colleagues uh, in the company. So quite some different uh, perspectives. Um, one additional interesting one uh, to point out is the performance management designed by employees. And this again is an example of um, putting the, the employees almost in the lead in designing uh, things or at least co-creating uh, with them. Um, and you see a reference to Uber, uh, this company who has really gone to a lot of people in their organization to first decide or understand why would you want to have performance management? What purpose would it need to serve from your perspective? And then how are we as a company going to build that together with you? Which is at least from a lot of the experiences I have from the past, uh, very different than you know designing this in headquarters and deploying it uh, through the rest of the organization, and then only letting it land uh, with employees. Joyce, if I can just add there one point also on, on performance management, we see also yeah. that it's much more 
about the interaction and the on the continuous conversation between employees and leaders so it is also changing there where performance management was a process that was once or twice a year yeah. uh, now to go in really in a continuous feedback loop yeah thank you philip and there with indeed the conversation is much more around continuous feedback and development rather than a one time or two times per year well verdict or assessment of how you are doing yeah thank you now if we look at how does do we see this translate in uh, how we are organized or set up as HR teams? Uh, you would see this on the next slide. Um, and maybe you recognize this from your practices, but what we see um, in a lot of uh, the classes that we have been taught right, in our schools and in our practices, uh, we operate a lot on the left hand of this spectrum, what we call the Ulrich side and Ulrich uh, has become very famous in uh, structuring uh, HR, structuring operating models, uh, bringing typologies for uh, competencies in HR for instance, where uh, maybe you have a classic one and an evolving one but what they have in common on the left side of the page is that they are very company centric. So the setup of HR is reflecting uh, the setup of the company and the focus is that we manage employees, eh? we see uh, employees as asset, assets in the company almost, with a high focus on uh, increasing performance uh, through effectiveness and efficiency. So also the way we design our HR activities is often along, let's benchmark a very credible or leading company, and then let's apply the same thing or slightly different thing uh, in our company. So a lot of benchmark-based activities. First is what we see evolving on the right side of this page, uh, the progressive and the disruptive models, uh, which are really employee-centric. So rather than looking at the company setup and taking that as leading, really looking at what do employees need? Uh, and how are we then gonna reflect that in also the way we work on the HR side? So you see examples of uh, the HR director or the HR leader being now called the chief employee experience officer because their main focus is to optimize uh, employee experience. And Maria is gonna tell us a lot about this. Uh, we also see already maybe at the next stage uh, what we call consumerized HR. So that's where you see that it's no longer solely uh, an employee focus, but it's actually client or customer experience and employee experience merging. Because in both instances, you're looking at how do people experience working with us or buying stuff from us or supplying things to us. Uh, so there's where you see a lot of merging of, or you could say former departments or activities in a company that all have an impact on that experience. So it could be marketing, it could be IT, it could be facilities. Um, so no longer a, a department focus, but really a, a joint approach uh, to make sure that jointly we optimize the way we uh, impact experience of people. So that brings us to a short storyline on how HR is impacted in the future of work. If we can go to the next slide, then this is where I'd like to give it uh, to Maria. Um, and maybe let's do a first a check, uh, Maria, whether we need a short break at this stage. Or we're doing yes. a bit later in your storyline. Ivan, team, what do you think? We had uh, five uh, minutes. All right. How do you think, guys? Like, if you want a break, uh, uh, we can make a five minute break, or we can proceed and then we make a break before the question and answer session. So, uh, 
if some participants want to 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 make to make a break, uh, you can just sum up uh, in the, in Zoom or just type it in chat, and then we will make a short break for coffee or something else maybe. So our aim is to optimize your experience today. Exactly. Yeah. All right. That's why we're asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So right. I see a couple of people. In the in the previous in the previous world, we would just have decided that there is a break now, but we are not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some feedback. It's one person said that no, we don't need that. <laughs> okay. All right. If you want, if you want, uh, if you want a break, we can make it as well because, like, it's important to uh, for us that you are happy as well. <laughs> Let's go okay. on, and maybe we'll check again in uh, fifteen or twenty minutes. Yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. That's good. Okay. Please interrupt me. If, uh, yeah. Yeah. Maria, just right. just from well, just from the sound, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Is it better like this? If you get a better? little bit closer to the screen, it's 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 a little bit better. Yeah, I like think. This? Yeah, okay, go. All right, perfect. Thank you so, so much for notifying me, Philippe. Um, and thank you, Joyce, uh, for handing uh, the presentation to me. Um, so for now, um, we will take a closer look to employee experience. And we wanted to start with the definition of employee experience, because this is a concept that is very much connected to customer experience. But whether we're talking about employee experience or customer experience, at the end of the day, it's all about human experience, right? So it's about the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, experience that you have when you're joining a company, while you're working at the company, and also why not when you're leaving a company. So it's everything that somebody feels while being part of a community or being part of an organization. We also have different experiences at home. We have different experiences as users of apps, of mobile phones. We have different experiences as consumers and even as citizens. So when we talk about employee experience, we talk about how do you feel when you wake up in the morning and you know that you're about to go to work? How does it feel when you're having a feedback session, if you're a manager and you need to give feedback to your employees? How does it feel when you're coming back from your maternity leave or your parental leave? So employee experience is one of the core trends that we see in human resources. But before we go further, we wanted to simply um, check which of the following is true for you. And we have four options here on the screen. And Ivan, I'm not sure whether the poll is um, is enabled and we can have yes, some Yes, sure, answers. it's enabled. So we will yeah. ask, uh, we will ask, we will ask Eugenia to, uh, to, 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 to start the poll. So it would be great to know whether you have or not any current plans to consider employee experience. All right, one moment, I will just... So if you have no current plans to consider employee experience, that's option one. If you're researching what others are doing in employee experience, and we can send you so many materials on this topic, you can choose two. There it is, yeah. Yeah, there, there it is. is. You can walk yeah. now. Yeah. Maybe some of you are already getting started with employee experience. Maybe some already have an employee experience strategy in place. Uh, the one thing maybe I should ask, it's uh, our translators to translate the questions from English to Russian. Yeah. So option one, we have no current plans to consider employee experience. Option two, we are researching what the others are doing in employee experience to understand more. Option three, we are getting started with employee experience. And the last option, we have an employee experience strategy in place. Mm 
right hand people are, have already voted yes i cannot see the answers because i'm sharing my screen with the presentation yeah yeah Maybe yeah we'll, Ivan, we'll, 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 sure sure i will me. tell you yeah uh, now 11 percent really uh, have uh, voted 27 percent are for we have no current plans to consider Mm -hmm. uh 27 percent are for the second options we are researching what others are doing in play experience to understand wonderful. More. Wonderful. and uh, almost uh, the half of people were uh, telling that we are getting started with simply experience awesome uh, very good that's great to know that's great to know thank you so much so, so for now i will hide it but you can vote because not everyone has voted all right mm -hmm. all right perfect so let me just go on with um, the fact that investing in employee experience has a very solid business reason. So we have been researching multiple companies and we saw that um, there, is a, there is a business reason behind investing in employee experience. Companies that are taking care of their employees companies who care about how their employees are feeling are performing better. So they get better business results. It's also from a perspective of positive psychology. So as we know, if you're happier, you're simply performing better. Now I just got the, uh, sorry, I got the answers from the poll on my screen, but I'll just click back. All right, so here you can see um, a couple of data points on how companies that are investing in employee experience are doing better than the others. So just to move forward, we've been in the past three years researching, as I mentioned, and interviewing companies that have started with employee experience. We wanted to know the reasons why they wanted to do this. So here you have some of their answers. Some organizations have done it in order to build a stronger culture. Other organizations have done it for a business reason. Others realized that by treating their employees better, they will also win more customers. So there is a variety of reasons why organizations are investing right now in employee experience. Also in our study, we've been taking a survey um, with more than 200 companies. We wanted to know, sort of track the progress of their interest throughout time. And you can see here on the right side, what a big jump in interest since three years ago. And what is also very important is that 50% of the companies that we've surveyed said that they have set a budget aside to execute their employee experience strategy in 2020. That's a lot of companies. So what does it actually mean, employee experience? Just like Philippe and Joyce mentioned in the first part of the presentation, when we look at HR, human resources right now, we need a different way of thinking and doing. In the old way of operating, you're basically starting with a problem defined at the top. Maybe it's your manager or your leader who is defining a problem and gives a mandate to the human resources team to solve it. And then you start working, designing a strategy somewhere in your crystal tower without including employees, without asking anybody else about what, do they, what would they need. And then you start deploying it in business units, in regions, and you ask for people to implement your HR strategy or your HR program. Then you start measuring and what you get in the end is a solution very much close to um, what you've originally designed. Maybe you will make some minor tweaks, but you get a complete untested solution. 
that might not really match the needs of people. So this is the classical way of working, but there is a different way of working, which is a little bit more democratic. For employee experience, the basic idea is that you co-create with employees. So you define the problem by those who are closest to the source. If you want to build a new learning program, the first starting point is interacting, interviewing, talking to people who would be using that program, right? So you study their reasons, their behaviors. Then you co-create, gather with them, analyze their experiences, what frustrates them when they're learning something new, or what frustrates them when they are coming back from a maternity leave, or what, what was exciting for them when they were a candidate in your recruitment process. So you start analyzing what, what are the issues. Then you start developing solutions, and these are prototypes. So it doesn't have to be a final solution. And you build new ways of working together with your employees, but you keep on testing and improving what you have built. So what you get is a solution which is prototype and tested. And the advantage is that the solution that you would come up with if you're co-creating with the employees, it's something that they will probably use a lot more than in the first version on the left side. Yeah, I will move on. Employee experience is built on three elements. Design thinking, which takes a human-centered approach. At the very heart of design thinking are the human needs. Behavioral science, also because understanding behavior means understanding why people are doing certain things, what motivates them, what brings them under a joint purpose. So really understanding how you can work with behavior and come up with solutions that really function in practice so that you don't create in a way that doesn't match what actually people need. This is about making human resources relevant to people. And the third element, cognitive and predictive analytics you have an opportunity to use multiple data points. Not only data points on, for example, how many people are seeing your job uh, post on LinkedIn, how many people are coming to apply in the recruitment process for your website. There can also be data points related to how, how are your candidates um, feeling? What kind of feedback did they give you? How long did the recruitment process Take? How much did they have to wait to get an answer, a positive or a negative from you? So at the core of employee experience is design thinking, our focus on behavior and analytics. And just to dive into analytics, the most important aspect is that emotion is data. So if cognition is helping us to make sense of the world, emotion assigns value. And this is something quite different from the way we are used to see the world, where usually emotions at work and vulnerabilities, we tend to hide them, we tend to dismiss them, we tend to say that they are not important. But for employee experience, they are. We are relying a lot on getting to know and to understand what our employees are actually feeling. And that's a valuable piece of information that is data. That is data we can work with. Because if we're doing positive things for our employees, the emotion goes on the positive side. So we can measure our progress. And of course, you have employee surveys, you have engagement surveys. People are telling you how are they feeling, whether they engaged or not. 
But if you're doing the right things, the engagement is going up. Yeah. Maria, ju just as you are pointing out engagement, I think it's also important yes. to um, to stretch the idea that uh, we, we also think uh, engagement surveys is also the old way of doing it uh, because uh, the organization decides what questions are asked to employees where in employee experience uh, we rather tend to stay away and co-create and uh, have more open uh, open-ended questions absolutely thank you so much philip for adding that so as philip mentioned engagement surveys is just the company asking a certain set of questions to the employees, but not really being engaged in the conversation. So let me dive deeper into design thinking, because the three pillars of design thinking are empathy, ideation, and experimentation. And when we talk about empathy, it means really getting engaged and listening to how people are feeling and what they actually need. It's not about understanding an ideal situation, but what really happened to them. Really put yourself in their shoes and create a safe environment in which your employees can tell their experiences. Another pillar is ideation. So you're not supposed to come up with the perfect answer, the perfect solution from the first try. The whole point is to have multiple ideas and be able to expand the horizon of possibility. It's okay if many of the, these ideas will not be implemented in the end. That's, that's the point, that's the purpose. That's part of the journey. And the third pillar is experimenting. So you're not implementing a new program from the very start, but you are experimenting with small steps. You're testing those ideas with prototyping. You're getting the feedback of your users. You're getting the feedback of your employees. And it's okay to fail. In design thinking, failure is important. It's necessary. It is a learning point. We don't run away from failure. So these are the three pillars of design thinking. Now, if you're familiar with the concept, you must know, of course, this double diamond of design thinking when you start with ideating, oh, sorry, you start with empathizing. So you question how, how, what do our employees feel? Then you define what is the actual problem that they have. And then you start opening again the space to discover what are the options? What are the ideas? that can transform their experiences, their moments that matter into wow moments. What can make it better? And then the prototyping and the testing stage. These are, this is um, taken from the design council. You can also explore more online. Um, the double diamond is famous because it has this divergence, convergence, divergence, convergence shape. So you open up Find it, to define what is the problem mm -hmm. and then you open it again and then you finally decide which solution so it sort of mimics almost the dance in your mind mm -hmm. i think i think what is an important what you just pointed out is in the middle part so the design briefing or the moment that matters um because uh, sometimes we we tend to uh, start from an assumption not knowing what the problem is and by having the first diamond you're really uh, opening up and then uh, closing it back down and to say at the end of the first diamond you know what your what problem we really want to focus on and then start again uh, the in the same process by opening up and closing again and come to prototyping and testing so uh, i think this is the the classic one this is uh, when we know what the problem is. So for instance, if we say, well, let's focus on onboarding uh, and then Maria will take you now to the next one. Yeah, do you want to continue, Philippe? No, 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 go, go, go. Yeah, 
So um, I had an example not from onboarding but from recruitment. Okay. So according to the first uh, to the first uh, to the initial slide with the double diamond, um, if you already know that there is an issue with your recruitment process, you basically start just with the empathize and then you um, define what is the issue. Maybe um, you take too long to respond to candidates and you lose very good talent, right? And you don't want that anymore. But we are seeing many organizations that do not have a clarified starting point. So this is why we sort of invented this triple diamond as an invitation to take a step back. So when we interact with organizations that want to get started with employee experience, we sort of replicate an initial diamond in which we start by simply exploring what is happening in the organization? What are the narratives that our employees are telling? What different data points we have that we can use? So we are sort of also set, make, make sense, making sense of what are the stories and what could be our areas of focus. And maybe from that exercise, we realize hmm, there is something with recruitment. So then we have our starting point clarified and then we can move forward to the second diamond. Yeah, so these are the differences between um, the initial model, model of the double diamond and the triple diamond. We use the triple diamond when there is no starting point clarified and we simply have organizations coming to us and saying, we want to get started with employee experience, but we have no clue for what, yeah? Anything else, Philip, that you wanted to add here? No, nope, no. Nope. Yeah. All right. So let me give you just some examples because we've been talking about um, I briefly mentioned mentioned employee journeys. Um, this is actually a poster from a workshop uh, we had with um, a company in France, um, and they they created different employee journeys. Examples of employee journeys are, for example, my first week at work, uh, when I joined a new team, um, when I want to think about my next career move, my first week at the job, I mentioned coming back from parental leave, or if I quit my job, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a human resource process, right? So. For example, if I'm coming back from maternity leave, maybe there is no specific human resource process for that, but it does matter how I'm being welcomed back into the team. Maybe I'm feeling overwhelmed. I missed so much. There are so many new faces at the office. Who are these people? I've been missing out on so many things. I don't know anymore what my role is. So it's very important to take that into consideration. The example that you see here as you see here in the uh, upper right corner, it's a journey for my first week at work. So what have we done in this workshop? Uh, we gathered um, a small team and we asked them, oops, sorry, I just clicked, I need to go back. And we asked them to tell us moment by moment what happened in their first week at work. Right, so um, I was welcomed at the reception and then I went to my desk and I found my laptop and my phone and everything was set up, but something was not working. And then I met my, I was supposed to have a meeting with my manager, but he didn't show up. Um, and then I had uh, a colleague of mine taking me around, introducing me to people and that was really nice. Um, we had a team lunch. Uh, I met other stakeholders. Um, I got to know more about my responsibilities and so on. So we really asked them, what do you remember from your first week at work? What worked, what didn't work? So the first row here defines moment by moment what happened. And then below in yellow, we asked them to tell us more about what actions everybody took. So maybe my, lab, my email didn't work. I didn't have an email until the end of the first week. So I went five times to the IT team and I still couldn't figure it out together with them what happened. So these are the actions. And then below, you can see there are emotions. So we asked them to uh, really express their feelings. How, how was it that particular moment for you? 
And then we were looking at moments of pain here in red. You see a cluster of red post-its, which, which was an indication for us that that was a sensitive moment. So we have chosen this moment that was painful to explain, for, to explore further, what can we do in order to change that experience? So that for new generations of people who are joining the company, they don't get through the same pains, but they have a different positive type of experience. Maria, if I just can add one one uh, additional observation to that one yes. is also um, I think what is also um, important if you look at the the emotions so the uh, the, the the pains or or, or so so what uh, Maria pointed out it is important to uh, name the emotions so for instance if they uh, felt angry or they were disappointed uh, mm. when we when we know that emotion then we can also do something because emotion is the closest closest to behavior. So yes. we then we can say if there was disappointment, then we have to do something to uh, repair the disappointment in our design then. Yes, absolutely. And also positive emotions are equally yeah. important because those are giving us an indication of what, uh, what excites people, yeah. what yeah. makes them feel like they belong in a team, in a company. Yeah. So if I'm moving on, can I ask one question? Yes, Joyce. Can we do a quick uh, customer check on the energy, whether we need a break or an energizer? All right, let's do that. So guys, if you want to make a, a quick a quick break for five minutes, we can do it right now. Uh, maybe we should do that without, without <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> waiting for reply. Let's take a five minute break. Ivan, can you okay. tell us when to be back? So now it's, uh, let's uh, come back in five minutes. So it's uh, 1327 in Minsk, but yeah. I don't know the time uh, of the people uh, that are taking part in the, the webinar. So uh, so waiting for you in five minutes then. It's well, we're all right. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Who to exit in McJoyce and a number of other colleagues in a hallway with a webinar with HR colleagues in uh, Bella, Russia, of all places. Maki uh, Kiyo, I'll accept this Bella.
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to, to continue. So uh, is everybody here? You could type in chat if you are here or you can just sum up. All right, I see that everyone's here. So we can continue our conversation now. And All right, I need to turn your to Yes, thank you so much, Ivan. <laughs> yes, no worries, no worries. All right. All right, so uh, I hope everyone is back refreshed from the brief break. I will continue by um, giving you an example of an employee journey from an HR perspective. So if you're considering the whole life cycle of an employee who is joining a company, you basically recruit the person, then they're going through their first 30 days. Um, then there is um, you know, performance discussion, what is expected of me, how can I be developed, um, uh, receiving the compensation, my first salary, sick leave, succession planning, then maybe I'm deciding to leave and I'm being told goodbye. So this is the process from an HR perspective. But there is so much more happening from an employee perspective. And let me go now to the next slide. Because from an employee perspective, oops, I clicked one too many. Oops, let me just try to go back. Sorry for that. So if we're just diving a little bit in the moment of joining a company, there is so much more happening in the backstage. It's like a theater play. You have a front stage, and usually in HR, we're very much focusing on what's happening in the front stage, but there is also a backstage. And if we're looking at an experience of an employee who is joining your organization, so much is happening. I need to leave my old workplace. Maybe my colleagues are throwing me a nice goodbye party, but maybe I need to move to a different country for this new job. So I have to move my family. My partner, my husband needs to find maybe a new work there. My children need to go to a new school. I don't know how to make a new budget for the new country I'm going to move in. And so many other different aspects that are just part of life. So in employee experience, you're not looking at your employees just from the perspective of what they experience at their workplace, but also in their totality of their life experience. What does it mean when they are being part of the organization? Just to move further now, we wanted to share with you some of the key trends from our annual employee experience research study. We wanted to highlight only three of them. There are so many, and we will send you the uh, reports also by, uh, by email through the organizing team. But for the purpose of this presentation, we wanted to focus on only three of them. One is about creating organizational empathy. So it's really about making sure that you establish a human connection with your employees, that you understand their journeys, you understand which are the moments that really matter to them. You understand if there is pain in those moments, if there is disappointment in their, those moments and you work together with them to create what we call wow moments, moments that generate a positive impact for them. The third insight, the, the, the second insight, sorry, the second trend is on building and scaling capabilities. Like I said at the beginning, employee experience is being inspired from customer experience. So there is already lots of knowledge about how to take the human needs into consideration, how to research them and so on. It's almost like human resources need to be a little bit more like marketing. And some of you in your organizations might already have great marketing experts. So right now we think that human resources in your human resources department or team, you shouldn't have only human resources uh, people who have graduated the human resources university and then have only worked in human resources. 
it's also important to bring more discipline, multidisciplinarity. So look for those capabilities inside your organization and consider maybe hiring people from marketing or customer service because they can teach you a lot, many methodologies of how to get closer to your employees. And then the third one, we're talking about agility. Remember, I mentioned that it's very important in employee experience to be able to experiment, to have freedom to fail. So it's very important to keep the mind open and just work in iterations. You don't need to uh, come up with a perfect solution from the very first try. There can be a lot of pressure, especially from leadership for us in human resources to come up with a solution like this, and it also needs to work instantly. No, it's very seldom that this happens. So instead of embarking in a journey of eight months, one year, to come up with a new HR strategy that you create in your crystal tower without connecting, without researching, without talking to your employees to understand what kind of culture they need and so on, it's way better to try to take small steps and be able to come back and reiterate your solution by incorporating their feedback. It's almost like, I like to say that employee experience is more a like a democratic way of functioning in an organization, a more democratic way of working together with your employees. So I have only three slides left um, in terms of just very quickly how we are usually working with organizations um, when we take them through this employee experience journey. We start with the user in mind. So we ask companies, how can you create value for your employees and who do we need to start researching and interviewing? We invite them, teach them how to do deep listening, how to take different data points from different systems they have. We help them define the right problem. There is always a risk to spend a lot of time and a lot of resources for simply the wrong problem. So it's very important to spend enough time in defining what is the actual problem that you want to solve. Then together with them, we have workshops, activities, boot camps, and these are days that we spend together with HR leaders and also employees to get them involved in the process, to get them to co-create solutions. And we always invite them to start small. It doesn't have to be a big budget. It doesn't have to be uh, a big change because usually these are reasons for us not to go into action but we want to make action possible. And then lastly, as I mentioned in being agile, we experiment, we learn, then we experiment again, then we learn. And for this process, it's like an iteration, we get to a more sustainable solution. Maria, just there as also as an, um, uh, for the last part, it's uh, also one of the things we say, uh, Try, try fast, fail fast. Um, yes. And if you, if you like, from a sprint methodology, in, in you can really condense that and, and and do some prototyping, and then test it out and and take the feedback and then uh, either throw it away or or uh, improve it. But I think there are definitely the the element around speed um, and and not being. Uh, hooked upon because sometimes with the classic approach you design a performance management process and it takes you months and months and months and months to de to develop it and then uh, you, you test it out and people get um, really hooked upon their design and mm. they are not willing to let it go if it's let failing it uh, yeah. yeah so i think yeah. that's also yeah. an important yeah. one yeah absolutely thank you so much Philippe. so it's about not getting attached to the results 
if you invest so much in building something that you did not include others in building and when you come out with it and it's being rejected it's painful <laughs> but it's unfortunately a waste of, of resources this is why it's so important to build together with others to come up with solutions together with your with your employees and i remember we learned that if um, you come up with your first solution with your first experiment if you're not a little bit ashamed of it it means that you didn't get it right you should be a little bit ashamed of your first solution because it's not supposed to be perfect and you should be able to also let it go and expand it further yeah so thank you so much for that philippe <clears throat> so in the last slides we wanted to um, give you just a bit of a taste of how we're working um, with different organizations um, in our boot camps we usually start with helping them define the problem, so define which of the area of HR or maybe outside of HR that they would like to focus on. Um, and then we dive deeper into that with specific methodologies, so structured interviews, um, surveys, organizational um, observation, for example, shadowing. These are methodologies that we use in order to find more about what is, the, what is the problem and what are the narratives? And together with them, we uh, come together uh, usually in two days of workshop um, and we start mapping, as you've seen in the previous slide, there is a poster and we work with post-its um, to be able to tell what, what is their experience. It's very important to let them tell their experience um, and not uh, and not interfere, not say, oh, from an HR perspective, this is wrong. No, it should be their experience. And it creates a lot of empathy and understanding between HR and employees. So we want to understand what actually happens to employees. So what do they experience? Not what is ideal and what kind of process we build, because their experience might be very different from the process. I think there it's also important to mention that you that you the more you can bring in real employees into this space, uh, the better Absolutely. your experience will be. Absolutely. So in our workshops, <coughs> excuse me, we usually like to um, we invite um, our clients to um, uh, to really bring real people <laughs> from people they actually they actually want to build a solution for not only people from HR. So it's very important to stay, to, to open the stage of co-creation. And then um, also in the bootcamp, um, we validate um, the problems that we've identified, the journey maps with the, um, with the targeted audience. Um, so we look for their feedback. We identify which are the moments that matter for them. And then we move into a hackathon. The hackathon is a very fun part of the day in which with different brainstorming methods, we push, we push a little bit the limits in terms of inviting them to think really broad. And we have sometimes really, really crazy and creative ideas of, um, of how, to, uh, how, to make things, how to make things differently. So for example, we know of a company that wanted to include in their um, uh, onboarding uh, process um, going with the team together to an escape room. That's a type of experience that helps them to get to know each other better and creates uh, a more intense bonding in the team in their first week at work. So really in this context, the, the focus is on creativity and you don't, you're not judged for your, your ideas. The point is to come with as many ideas as possible. Because eventually, one of them or a couple can be chosen to be taken further. And in that process, we call it a design sprint. In that process, we basically create, a, we focus on one idea and we create a storyboard. How does it actually work? So our workshops are really visual. It's almost like you create a scenario for a movie and step by step, you're explaining what is the employee experiencing in this new vision that you have. And then you have an opportunity to pitch 
your vision, pitch your your um, uh, your prototype to the real users to get feedback. And there is very important to include there not just the general idea, but details. How would it work? How will you pilot it? Um, how will you implement it? How do you start small? Who else do you need? Maybe you need someone from IT. Maybe you need someone from facilities. What kind of feedback are you seeking from your employees? So this is a little bit of the structure that we have in place in order to take companies and organizations in general, because we also work with the public sector uh, and universities. Um, this is a bit of uh, uh, the storyline of how we take uh, organizations through uh, discovering what they can do with employee experience. And it's a very nice feeling at the end of the day when you see people are usually incredibly energized, empowered, and really ready to go into action and come back to work and start implementing some of the ideas that they had. It's usually a very condensed experience of two, three days, but it brings so much to the team. And with this, I'm uh, closing my part of the presentation. Joyce? Very much. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yes. So what we had in store for you, um, and we realized that we've been sharing quite a bit of information uh, and perspective. So we wanted to help you maybe for today, maybe for tomorrow or after this session, to also continue to digest a little bit of what we have shared, but especially also uh, translating in that into what does it bring to you? So what, do, what would you take forward? Or what are your main insights from this? Because all of us and all of you work in different contexts. So what may be relevant for one person uh, could mm -hmm. be very different for another person. Now, one thing you may wanna just take a moment for to reflect on now is just noting down what are those one or two key takeaways uh, for today. And then those remaining questions that you see here are mainly intended for you to, uh, to take home and at a moment that you choose look back at this, but maybe we'll just take one minute for all of us to reflect and note down some of the key takeaways. All right. All right, so maybe now we can ask uh, uh, some questions. What do you think? Uh, all right, uh, now I turn my video on because, oh wait, oh wait, not a video, all right, there we go. No, I don't need this background actually now. Sorry. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, now I got, uh, I want to thank you first of all, because like it is really hard to, to, to make a, a presentation to speak for almost two hours. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really hard. And thank you very much for that. Uh, now we have some questions uh, that, uh, that, we received during uh, our conversation. And uh, actually, uh, you can now ask the questions while uh, we are making this session. Uh, we'll be now, one moment. Yeah, we'd All be right. happy to take questions, uh, Ivan. Yes. Yeah, great, thank you. So the first question was, what is uh, what do you think is the most effective employee motivation system uh, tangible or intangible? If all together, then what should you should be the proportion? Mm -hmm. So tangible and intangible uh, motivation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I think I can take that one because I also had it in the in the first in the questions that were sent before. Um, I think the the motivational uh, part is is very individual. So I think there is not a one size fits all answer to that question. I think um, so. Um, definitely one that I don't believe in is that um, it, it it's it's 
uh, salary, I don't think it's the motivational one uh, because um, you can have the best job in the world, but the worst uh, or a bad salary, it will not motivate you, nor the other way around. If you get a very high salary, but not a, a, a good job, it will not be motivational. So I think um, salary should be, uh, I would say, a it should be at the right level. Um, and, and that, of course, is difficult to define. But I think what would really, um, where I would say uh, from a leadership development perspective, um, know yourself as good as you can, uh, what gives you energy uh, and what motivates you. So what, if you have to get out of bed in the morning, what gives you energy? And that can be different for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but try to figure that out. Um, and if you can, I would say, personalize that um, to the maximum. So again, it comes to your, your people leader. Uh, your people leader should know you, his, his or her people as good as possible and then try to, to give them the best motivational environment, I would say. But mm -hmm. it is very individual. And yes, it's your direct manager who is responsible for. It is not HR's responsibility to do that. It is the people or the line manager, I think, who should be uh, mm -hmm. in the front line for that. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe the person who asked the question want to make some comment here. You can make it in chat or you can ask to turn on your mic. We don't have much time, but anyways, why not? All right, so you'll tell us. Uh, so we've got one more question. Um, it's about the uh, isolation time. And so of course, uh, the question is, what do you think when self-isolation and quarantine are over? Will everyone who works remotely now return to the office? Uh, for whom <laughs> remote work has become a more effective solution? Uh, for whom not? So it's like a, more, like a common yeah. question here. Yeah, I'd love to, to react, but probably all of us have our personal uh, yes. experiences. Mm -hmm. no, I, I think we, uh, what for sure we hear back, and probably also what we translate from our own um, experience, is it had, has changed perspective. So we've seen environments where it was not at all the culture to work remote, uh, that today realize, hey, business continues, if all of us uh, work remotely. And also we've seen a lot of examples where sort of combining or integrating your personal life or your family life, for instance, with your work life uh, has become much easier on the one hand, but sometimes also much more a challenge on the other hand, because if I'm working at my kitchen table and my kids are doing, I have two small kids, uh, their homework, uh, as well, it's much more difficult to focus um, than when I'm in a quiet office. So I think what this brings us is at least, uh, hopefully, um, a continued higher awareness of what it could bring and what the pros and the cons are. Uh, and I hope it brings us that we dare to make decisions uh, that could be different than how we did things in the past. Mm -hmm. And what exactly it looks like that is a question per probably individual, per team, per company context. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to add to that, I, yesterday I did a, a little webinar for a, a big pharmaceutical company here in Belgium on this topic. And many people reacted. They say, for me, it has also, because we have a huge mobility problem here in Belgium, so we're ah. stuck in traffic. And a lot of people said, I, I have... I have now experienced that I have much more time. Um, so I truly hope that uh, here in Belgium, some employers might be more open to this kind of home working. So I, I think some, some, some stuff will, will change anyhow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if I can add to that, um, just a moment to recognize how privileged we are for being able to do our jobs from the safety of our homes. Yeah. Working because, of course, if you're a factory working, for example, or your your employment is not so secure, there is there is no way to, to do that. But um, 
this goes very much in line with what we've presented about you know the future of work. It's it's really having that flexibility and being able to realize that all right, things can be done differently sometimes. But there is there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of many conversations right now are around how can you offer a better employee experience for people who are working from home and. Maybe it's not really, um, it's a bit, a bit of an injustice to say they are working from home. You're not working from home. You are at home trying to work. Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the difference. And you have so many responsibilities. All your identities come, you are the partner, the husband, the wife, the mother, or maybe you're alone. For the first two weeks, I was alone in an apartment. And then it's, of course, from a level of engagement, one beautiful example that I can give, I've heard of um, a friend of mine, her manager invited them to have a breakfast meeting in bed at 8 a.m. <laughs> so they all, they were all in their pajamas and they all met to start the day and just talk about how are they feeling. So it's, it's very important to keep that human, um, yeah, the human touch. Who would have done that? Uh, two months ago, right? Or two months three months ago. ago. Who would have thought about having a breakfast yeah. in bed meeting two months yeah. ago? So <laughs> it's also boss. an opportunity for, for creativity, but that's that's for us who are privileged to be able to do our jobs from home. Yeah, thank you. It's for sure like it will change something. Maybe some jobs will disappear. And some uh, things we are talking about uh, today maybe will be not so uh, demanded uh, but we will see that only in the future because now we just are sitting home uh, actually we are streaming now from home and not going anywhere else and uh, I think that it brings new experience it's not nice always but it's good for now mm. <laughs> if it will yeah. continue for uh, one more year it would be bad I mm. think but maybe yeah. somehow our mind will change and we will get used to it yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, could we could could we move to the next question? Yeah. Then? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yes. All right. Uh, it is. What are the methods for an objective assessment of employees, and how do you use them in practice? The methods for uh, objective assessment. Oh, yeah. I think uh, you have all different kind of assessments. Um, so yeah. So you have different tools. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah. So the the the, the question is uh, quite a broad spectrum. Uh, but if I look from my past experience as a uh, head of talent management, I'll, I'll give you just my my two cents. Um, so, so I was responsible for a young graduate training program. Uh, so we had about 2,000 candidates for 10 positions. Uh, and what we applied um, is the, the following reasoning. Um, uh, Talent has all in common mental agility, so they're all smart. Uh, so what you can do is, is to first select on brain capacity. And therefore, what we use is, for instance, an abstract reasoning test. Um, and everything that was uh, above the median passed through and the rest dropped off. Um, about 60% was dropped out. Uh, but what you knew was the 40% that was left over were smart people. And if you look at talent, uh, that's the one co common denominator that is most persistent. That's brain capacity. But it only counts to 25%. So if you would only uh, test on brain capacity, you will miss out a lot of good talent. Um, and why? Because emotional intelligence has become much more important because we have to work in, uh, in teams uh, we have to lead, but we also have to be able to follow. So th there is um, this emotional intelligence is an important one. And you can also measure that, uh, for instance, through the big five uh, tests online, you can do that. Uh, but also through structured interviews or, or by uh, assessment centers. So there is different solutions. And then the last uh, two elements that I would put forward is then the action coefficient. So are you able to put it into action? And uh, Jack Welch said the four E's, and that's the best how I remember. Do you have energy? Are you able to energize? 
Are you able to execute? And are you able to go to the edge? So the four E's, and it's really the capacity to bring it into action. And then the last thing I always look at is self-awareness. Um, so leaders and people who are self-aware and, and people who know themselves, what their strengths and their weaknesses are, uh, those are often people who will move faster and will grow faster. So if I could give you one advice to look for is if you interview people, look how, how self-aware they are. Are they open to feedback? Do they know what they're good at? Um, so that would be my advice. Um, so, so that is how I look at talent from a, from a distance. All right, thank you. Maybe someone else want to comment uh, on that? Or do you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe you want to make some comments on that or we can continue to the next question. We oh, fully and, agree and, with our uh, colleagues. Yes, yes, yes. I thought you uh, were asking for and, comments and, from the audience. And and, and, uh, yeah, a right, and, right. and a and a final one I would add to that is then you have to look for the cultural fit, uh, because you Absolutely. can you can tick off the boxes on smartness, emotional intelligence, self awareness, but sometimes uh, they don't fit your culture, and then you don't you should not hire them neither, because we know that the biggest uh, reason for failure within the first year of attraction is non-cultural fit. So, uh, so if you have to let go people, it's often because they're not fitting your company culture. So be, also keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Yeah. Unless you have a you. clear reason to change your culture and you want to bring in some people who shake up. Yeah, good thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. But yes. they may not last in that sense for a long time, but it may be affected be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for some time. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you. All right, so we can, I think that we can move to another question. And uh, the question is from Anna. And the question was, what's in, uh, in your opinion, what are the most effective methods of dealing with simply stress, stress related to remote work? <laughs> so mm -hmm. how, sh how should people uh, deal with simply uh, stress while they're working remotely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe I can. Well, yeah, yeah. go. You go on, uh, on this one. Um, we've been reflecting on, um, especially observing on LinkedIn, how many people are jumping in with different tips and tricks and articles on how to be productive, how to make the most out of the, this time. So um, at the very beginning, I, we think it's very important to uh, realize that it is a stressful period of time for sure we won't be able to be as productive as in regular life so instead of always being focused on getting more done being productive being able to have a productive day just like you used to have it's simply very difficult so i think in the first um in the first stage it's very important to also give employees and also for yourself and for your own team enough space and time to simply digest what is happening. Digest mentally, digest with your heart what is, what is currently happening. And it can be very overwhelming. I know also from, um, yeah, from, from others, for example, at work, you might be having uh, meeting after meeting after meeting. You start at 10 and you have three meetings until lunchtime at one. Right now, it's not possible to have that freedom anymore. So it's maybe more mindful to put 10 minutes or 15 minutes and not make a full hour of meeting, but have it 45 minutes a call and then 15 minutes break before you start the new one, because it's just impossible to keep with the same rhythm. If, if you want, uh, if I can, uh, as I just yesterday did the intervention with the other client, I can yeah. add two, two more things there. I think also as a people leader, I think you need to be very empathetic at this moment in time because people um, have to cope with a lot of stress. And um, uh, in Belgium, we saw um, they did a measurement uh, on the workforce and they see that 
the, the toxic level of stress has been increasing and they measured this two weeks into the corona lockdown and it has tremendously increased. So mm -hmm. we know that there will be huge burnouts uh, in the next yes. couple of months. Uh, so we, we know that the workforce is under high stress uh, because they are very insecure due to the uh, coronavirus and it is, is big. Uh, so there will be huge, uh, huge um, impacts even further on. Uh, so I think as a people leader, we need to be very empathetic at this point in time, as uh, Maria also said, um, uh, or Joyce, the, the collision between our work and our life has become so, um, yeah, it has become one, uh, and people leaders need to be mindful of that. Um, um, so I think that is an important one. And then also, as Maria just mentioned, uh, what, what is your energy level? Um, and you need to know what gives you energy and what sucks energy. So at this point in time, you have to see if your, um, your meter is going into the red. You have to find uh, things that gives you energy. I'll give you mine. When I was traveling, uh, uh, I was traveling 35% in my uh, uh, corporate life. I always had my running shoes with me because running gives me energy. Um, and today, I, I also know some people that suck energy because they're always nagging. I, I avoid those people at this point in time because they take away my energy. And it is so hard in this um, you know, lockdown period. So be very mindful of your energy level. That would be my two additions. Can I add to this? So what we do quite sometimes is also give uh, what we call resilience trainings. So how, how do you cope with change and what does it do to you and what, can, what lies in your power uh, to deal with those changes or those tough times most effectively? Uh, and one critical well, mechanism or tool or approach, if you will, is exactly what Philippe is pointing out, so energy management. Uh, and there's a lot you can do in reading up on the topic, if you like. So what I always, I apply it big time myself. So I know what drains my energy and I know what builds my energy. And uh, when there's stress, I would very consciously um, focus on these things that uh, build my energy. Um, and there's also nice uh, approaches on how can you help frame things differently mm -hmm. in your mind. Because we have this tendency, that's the way our brain functions, to go into negative thinking spirals. Yes. And it's not because we're bad, but that's just the way we have been built. And it has helped us when we were escaping big dangers, right? Mm -hmm. um, in like prehistoric times. But now sometimes it's not helpful to us. So mm -hmm. understanding those mechanisms and doing the, the reframing of your thinking uh, you could look at uh, rational emotive therapy or uh, rational emotive thinking. That is how you can reframe uh, things. Could be very helpful mechanism uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And if I can add Thank to you. that. Yeah. Now we get passionate, huh? Yes, yes, it's a very passionate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can you add should. so many other things. Yeah. 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 yeah like meditation and yeah. yoga. And if you think about it, these are part of a well-being conversation, well-being component of uh, uh, the cultures of some organizations that was there also before this crisis, right? So for example, with Philips, we had um, evenings in which we had yoga classes at work. Yeah. So it's very important. And, and every Thursday we had half an hour meditation. So it's very important to pay attention to what can you do more for your for your employees. How can they uh, maybe sometimes even support each other? I've seen also uh, on some of the forums on LinkedIn, um, HR people asking um, 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 therapeutic or psychological support online that they can provide to their own employees. Yeah. So this is a very important topic and it's being taken seriously all over the world. Yeah, we yeah. see some of our clients uh, actually scale up their activities on this, mm. um, on the well these times. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. 
Uh, could we have some more questions, like two? I think that we have a little time for that. Because we have time for reflection. Yes, of course. Uh, so it's one moment. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Should I stop sharing uh, my screen so we can see everyone? I think like I am yeah, kind that, of lost that, without that, saying that would be appropriate. People. Yeah, that would be nice. Yes. yes. All right. Perfect. I'm just gonna stop, so then I can. All right. See everyone. Uh, it would be so nice right. to see more people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the question is: uh, Have you worked with universities, and you did? Uh, and what model do you offer them? Uh, not quite sure what this uh, model meaning here. Maybe you understand and uh, can comment on that. Yeah. Over to you, Philip. Yeah. Yes, Philip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I am. I am the university specialist. No, no, I am. Um, I'm doing a project for about three years now at uh, the university at Tilburg, uh, and that that um, that is a very specific environment because um, um, it, it's around a, a leadership uh, model. So what what they said they they had not a uh, common leadership model. Um, and in the university world, you can only get for two things. You can uh, get some decorations, some 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 credit. Uh, on the one hand side, it's your number of publications, so the research you're doing, and uh, to another uh, part, uh, yeah, what what how how good is your teaching? Um, but leadership is a little bit done on the side, um, and we have seen that it becomes more and more important to have good leadership because they. Um, the, the people leaders are really having huge teams they have to manage, uh, but also they have more and more external fundings that have to take place because uh, research is uh, granted sometimes by uh, then uh, corporate organizations. So they, the leadership aspect has become much more important. And uh, what, we, what we have done there is also from a co-creation point of view, uh, we have started with interviews with people uh, and we have uh, interviewed uh, with focus groups and so on in total uh, about a hundred people and uh, from there on we have built a um, a common uh, leadership model uh, and it's called connected to leading uh, if you look it up also if you google it you can uh, easily uh, find it um, and uh, it's about uh, yeah how how you build really a leadership model for the university environment. Um, so and uh, the, the main topics about uh, about it is um, also the starting point is growing self awareness. So we do a lot of activities around uh, helping them to to know better who they are and what their strengths is, and we do this from out of a positive psychology approach. So uh, with Gallup Strength Finder. Um, and, uh, and then it's around uh, leadership is, is about leading, but also about following. And it's also very much around dialogical leadership. So lesser, uh, because in a in an university environment, it works better um, if, you, if you go into a dialogue instead of saying, I know it all because it's very smart people and they all have an opinion on something. Uh, it's some, sometimes very tiring, uh, but I have a lot of great conversations with them. But um, so if you want to find out more, um, just just contact me and I'm, I'm more than happy to share. And Maria has placed some uh, information in the chat. Yes, well. yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes, we see that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, we have uh, 20 more uh more minutes so i got here one question it's the question it's it's very big question all right uh how do you see incorporate culture is being transformed when organizations will be represented by networks of networks as you had an, an example in your presentation and when uh all employees will be in different companies at the same time yeah can I uh, give a first response and then to my colleagues, uh, please chip in. So one thing that we foresee when uh, organization models become more loose, if you will, so if it's more networks that are connecting together, is that it's very important to create common purpose and common direction. 
And maybe that's not a purpose or a direction for the coming 10 years. Maybe it's only for this project of collaboration, but to have a very clear understanding of why are we together and what are we striving to do? Uh, and it may take a bit of time to actually bring people together uh, from, a, from a mindset and understanding perspective to jointly define answers to these questions. So the more you have clarity on uh, common need, common purpose, uh, and also an understanding of uh, how do we want to work together? So what are some of the sort of agreed starting points of our collaboration? Uh, the more that becomes the, yeah, the, the glue, if you will, that otherwise maybe you would create or would try to create at least uh, with departments mm -hmm. and reporting lines, etc. Yeah. Yeah. I think an interesting, an interesting example to look into, um, as it is also one of our clients, uh, is, is Novartis. Um, so two years ago, the new CEO arrived. Um, so, um, and, uh, Bas, and, and he, he made it very simple. Uh, so their strategic imperative is to reimagine medicine. Um, yes. So it, it's very simple, uh, but, but it has a very clear kind of purpose. They want to reimagine medicine uh, and, and this by doing not only creating molecules, uh, uh, but also to bring in how do we use information uh, data uh, platforms, much more this uh, approach of uh, when, when they bring medication into the, uh, into, into the market, that they also get the information flow uh, from, from end customers, uh, from therapists, from doctors. So he, he's really re, uh, restating it. And then he has it done very simply. He said, uh, be inspired. And, and be inspired means that you have to connect to this reimagine uh, medicine uh, thinking. And then he says, be curious. So try to learn as much as you can uh, go out there. And then the third one is create an unbust culture. And the unbust culture is really to give the freedom and the space to their employees uh, to, to figure it out themselves. Uh, and they are also, so it's, it's, very, um, it's very inspirational. You, you look them up uh, on YouTube, um, and I think I absolutely agree with Joyce. Um, if you start to work in those uh, networks of networks, it will be much more around, um, uh, yeah, I would say, purpose-driven kind of environment. So where are we going? But mm -hmm. don't tell them how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even also a practical mechanism that we see appearing uh, in this is that where we uh, maybe used to focus or generally have a tendency to focus on the people manager employee relation, uh, also from an HR perspective, huh? uh, we see uh, a shift to um, more team focus. So not necessarily the team boss and the team members, but just the integral uh, mm -hmm. community of the team. So how do they define their purpose? How do they define how they work? How do they agree? Uh, how do they keep each other accountable, give feedback, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, which is interesting if you also translate that into uh, HR uh, implications, because our work has generally been built slightly differently. Um, and at the same time, it's a huge opportunity to scale things, because instead of going from one leader to uh, one, one, one employee, you now just do work with one team. So we do quite a bit of team work, uh, working with uh, teams to uh, yeah, optimize their performance, their alignment, their quality of interaction, okay. and their sense of purpose. And, and also... Now you get us going. Yeah, also <laughs> one that is related to that is also that we see that uh, a, a number also to, to further build on the team aspect um, is that also that they move away from individual bonuses or individual yeah. uh, payouts so that they are saying instead of um, I, I give you a bonus, an individual bonus, I give you much more a team bonus. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it even goes to the extent that your remuneration is linked to team performance. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we should make one last question and then 
uh, try to to reflect on what we've here uh, what we're hearing here. I think that it would be nice because like it's certain minutes left. Uh, so if you if you if you give me a chance, I just read the last question. Uh, it is uh, it is question about motivation one more time, and it's question for Maria actually, but. No doubt, uh, <laughs> you can also, Philip and Joyce, you can also uh, contribute to this uh, answer. How to motivate management not to look for problems and make some decision from uh, above, but work on the second track? Mm. It's a great question. Yeah, it's always quite difficult to get the buy-in of our stakeholders, the buy-in of our leaders when it comes to um, um, a cultural shift. And the cultural shift can also start from the from the very bottom, but it's very uh, it's quite challenging when you need to take your leaders along. And just like Joyce and Philippe explained earlier, we don't live anymore in a world of individual performance. It's important, mm -hmm. of course, but if you have a team made up only by members who are solo performers, they will all go very fast in different directions but we need to move further as a team, right? Yep. And leaders are also part of that. So we need to think what kind of leadership, also what kind of leadership we have in the world today. What really works yep. in terms of being engaged and connected as a leader and really understanding that your own leadership, how much you are loved and, and, and connected with your people, which is actually what you also want to achieve, right? As a leader, depends mm. on your on your on your leadership style so yeah. sometimes change management also includes changing the mindset of your own leader i think one one we had one example um a specific on uh, employee engagement uh employee experience uh, that was with LearnVest. maybe you can share that one because they um i think elliot explained us that what there was a company it's called LearnVest. And they had a very lousy onboarding yeah. experience, and yes. um, and so the employees they said um, we we are going to design our own employee experience uh, on onboarding, uh, but HR cannot play with us. So uh, HR is not allowed to do the design with us. So and it, it was the employees in then in I think in Slack I think they built their own HR uh, their their own onboarding. So. Um, so sometimes don't don't ask for permission. Ask for um, apologies maybe afterwards. So yeah, that's a very good um, point. Yeah. So it, it's again like customer experience. Uh, before customers had, they didn't have a choice and they had not a voice. Um, with the technology, they now have an, a voice and they have choice. Uh, and it's the same with employees. Employees also have a voice. And they also have choice to go and work where they want. So um, if your uh, top management is not uh, following it, at some point in time, they will see very good talent walk out the door and go somewhere else. So I think it is not a, uh, it, it is a matter of time that they will, uh, if, if top management still thinks that they have to say how it, it's, it's going to happen. Well, mm -hmm. then probably they will be wrong in, in some time from now. And this can start in small steps. Eh? So we've been in companies where the whole philosophy of uh, employee experience was a bit strange to their, to their culture or to their natural approach. And then also we didn't say, let's go all the way uh, into employee experience. We just said, can we have, or can we create an interaction between leadership and some employees, like a lunch meeting or an, an inter, uh, a dialogue where we guide the leaders to only ask questions and not speak, but listen, uh, which in itself can be a, a beautiful experiment and a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's a small step. So not everybody, not for every context, it works to go like, big full approach on employee experience. Sometimes you need to start it gradually, small steps, and sort of build the understanding and the conviction with the belief that it helps. Great, yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, we have now uh, not a question because uh, I think that uh, we have all questions now. Uh, we've got a thanks to you from one moment. I will, I will just read it all the way down uh, so that I sure that I'm talking everything right. Uh, sorry. We're communicating on multiple channels. <laughs> yes, in multiple languages. Yes, yes, uh, a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, that, I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to try that. I'm not able to do that. So. <laughs> uh, it's actually uh, things from uh, Belarusian State University, uh, HR University, that uh, was visiting you last year on May 16 in Netherlands, uh, and uh, they say that it was an unforgettable experience, and they have mm -hmm. a great. Uh, they got a great impression, uh, uh, all the group, and uh, they will be glad to continue meeting you, and uh, will be glad to contact you after the webinar or maybe next week, and so on. So it's like that. Uh, very welcome. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we still great. think back very fondly of last year too, and we really <laughs> regretted that we couldn't meet uh, in person this, this time. Yeah. Who knows? Ne but next, but next year we'll do again. <laughs> Maybe we can come over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're most welcome. You can come, of course, here. Uh, all right. So maybe uh, we can reflect. We have seven minutes left. Uh, maybe we can reflect on, on what we've heard. Uh, you can uh, write it on chat, or it would be better if you turn on your mic and uh, say something to about the presentation. So if anybody wants to tell something with uh, voice, you can do that, and uh, we will translate it from Russian to English. So now I think that we should wait for that. <laughs> yes. right, I got some message on my phone, maybe some impression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an invitation to HR University in uh, Belarus State University in Minsk. So you can, you are most welcome there. You can, <laughs> when the COVID epidemic will end, yeah, it would be nice to, <laughs> yeah. to meet we'll you. I'd love to visit. <laughs> I'd love to visit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, one thank more you. thank you. It's many thanks to all speakers and organizers of the webinar. I hope it's not our last meeting. I would like to continue the study and deepen my knowledge in this topic. I will look for additional information in the network. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you as thank well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. All right. So, so I see no one want to, 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 to speak here with, with, with the mic. Uh, so then maybe we can uh, end now. And if you have any further questions, you can write us on Telegram. Uh, we have a chat and uh, we will transfer these questions to uh, to uh, Philippe, Joyce or Maria. And uh, if they will have time and they will uh, answer it. And, uh, and nice to meet all of you here. We have uh, today uh, 40 persons attending uh, on Zoom and uh, some people, many people on YouTube. I haven't seen how much. Maybe then I will share the information with you. It's really nice that we are staying uh, all together this uh, this time and share knowledge uh, with each other. And I want to say, say thank you one more time for all our speakers and to all attendees uh, for today. And uh, keep in touch. We will give you links on uh, Can the Fridge Company and I uh, will share with you uh, in, uh, a LinkedIn profiles maybe of Maria, Joyce, and uh, Philip, if you need them. So uh, now have a nice evening and have a nice day, and hope to see you again in a few weeks or maybe earlier. Bye. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.